Where theme park families Theme park fam- Hello kitties, it's your old pal the Crypt Keeper. Enough of this family friendly nonsense. It's December, and I know you are thinking it's reserved for that fat red suited overgrown elf, Chris Cringle. Well, I'm here to tell you that every month can be filled with frights and scares. Just ask my good fiend, Jack Skellington. <laughs> this episode isn't going to have any ho ho hoes, roller coasters, or swing rides. No, this will be a true December to dismember. <laughs> Since October is not that far in the mirror, let's light up the gulag, pour a frosty cup of legnog, and hear about some chilling haunt experiences from three parks on this ex-frighting new episode. Without further ado, this is Scream Park Family, with your ghosts, Adim and Andrew. <laughs> oh my gosh! Our podcast has been hijacked. He called our material nonsense. What's up with that? Are you okay? Are you scared? That's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that he hijacked our podcast? I don't know if it's embarrassing, although that does sound like a line I know from you, but I'm terrified. That's a scary voice. I'm sure you are. That's weird that that just popped up out of nowhere. Yep. I don't know if I'm more upset or scared. <laughs> Do you know that guy? And uh, not really, no. Well, <laughs> as you start getting more and more into horror, I think you'll get to know him a little bit. But that's actually our talented buddy, Brian. And that's so cool that he sent that over. Kind of weird how December turned into January, which turned into February. Yeah, that's I guess. Things are supposed to be easier in the winter, but it's turned out to be crazier. As you had winter soccer, and we had our holiday season going out to the Carolinas, and then we just started a new sport that you've really gotten into recently. What pickle is it that? You, yeah, pickleball. I think probably a lot of our audience doesn't know it. When I reference it to a lot of people, they're like, what is that? And it's the fastest growing sport in the country. Something that the two of us love. It's sort of like a miniature tennis with paddles and a wiffle ball. And it's turned out to be a ton of fun. And something that I am hoping here pretty soon that we can start doing some tournaments together. Yep. So between all that and now Alex is playing soccer, it's been crazy. But we're so glad to be back here with you guys with another episode of Theme Park Families, and it's just been too long, but we're hoping to get a little bit more regularly back into it, right, bud? Yeah, that's well, our goal. That is our goal, and thanks so much to Brian from the Civil Boar. From the <laughs> did I Was I going to say Civil Boar? <laughs> no. That, is that a Freudian slip? That is actually so rude. Brian and Tim, <laughs> no one Sorry. has ever called you the Civil Boar podcast civil gore podcast oh, that was rude did you tell me to say that no <laughs> just kind of i don't know you must have pronounced it wrong and exactly that's all some kind of slip that voice for you hardcore coaster radio listeners you might recognize that voice i think he actually kidnapped nph about five six years ago something like that ah uh, he's done it a lot i yeah, think at least a couple Hot times Wings. and if you know the crib keeper that voice is spot on he does it so well, and the puns, yeah. which Brian is the pun master. <laughs> yeah, that's, does that's such a, so funny. Ah, so funny. And a couple of weeks ago when we had our other snow apocalypse, I was listening to their episode called The Changeling, and I was shoveling about nine inches, and they really helped me with that whole shoveling <laughs> as it just kind of flew away as they're so entertaining. So if you like horror even a little bit, definitely check them out. And hopefully coming up pretty soon, I think, Andrew, the plan is to have you on an episode, and at some point we'd definitely like to have Brian and Tim pop onto our episode so stay tuned for that but really a funny take on horror and they really know their stuff and watch way too many movies I don't know how they have the time for it it's pretty amazing 
But it's a pretty great take, and I think those guys are blowing up. They're getting mentions on other podcasts now, and really starting to grow as. Yeah, they're, they're already at their one hundred or past their one hundred. No, 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 no. They're late eighties right now. I and think eighty nine. Right, and so it's only it's been I think about two and a half years, and they're really moving on. So it's a great show, and so thanks so much for sending that in. I guess then because Crib Keeper interrupted us, we have to talk some haunt stuff, and it might sound a little bit weird in February to be talking haunt, but a lot of people actually complain playing in October who listen to a lot of different theme park podcasts that oh my gosh haunt season that's all you ever hear haunt 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 and I'm not a big fan well this spreads it out a little bit right yeah true you know. I mean for all those people out there that don't like hearing haunt stuff in like October around haunt season well here you go this is the perfect podcast for you and those people who are thinking about going to haunt next year a lot of these houses as you know will still be there some yeah. might be changed out but the majority of them and you are never still know you might parks. get Christmas talk in the summer from us exactly hey you know it, it switches things up it's true we haven't talked about our Christmas experiences really yeah. at all but before we get there I wanted to take a quick second to give a shout out to a member of the family of blondes who left a review for us on iTunes that we talked about last episode you remember that you we chatted about that yeah and so those were the Larsons and James let me know that when he was listening with his daughter Lucy who's seven isn't that so cool I love the fact yeah. I mean I, you know that's what that's I love cool. to hear that potentially there are people of all ages that we don't really have a target age that we're recording for so if you're 92 or 7 or 40 or or whatever age you happen to be. Even two-year-olds. Exactly. I mean, because yeah, Maddie uh, voicing a couple things here and there. Yeah. And so she said that, Dad, we are the blondes and your name is James and was excited that we were talking about them. So, Lucy, thanks so much for that excitement, enthusiasm, and we hope to meet you at the parks coming up in the next season here, which is only a little over a month away. Here it's February. Yeah, it's parks exciting. start opening up in April, March. In March. March. Yeah, some of them down south. So this is very exciting. We're not that far away, even though we're recording this on a snow day. So we are excited about that season coming up soon. Also, keep up that aggression on the defenseman with the ball in soccer. I showed Andrew a couple of those videos that Proud Dad had posted. And that steal shot score combo. That's one of your favorites, isn't yeah. it, dude? <laughs> right, pressure the defenseman, steal it, score the goal. Isn't that what you do? Occasionally, right? Travel soccer, Andrew. Is your microphone broken? Hello, testing one, two, three. Three. <laughs> Andrew, are you there? Three. What 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 happened to you? Three. You you don't want to discuss your soccer? Three. Oh, right. So that's enough of that. But awesome goal scoring, just like I guess Andrew does, although he's too embarrassed to talk about Three. it. Before we get to our scary talk, let's get some news. SeaWorld San Diego announced the 2020 edition of Mako, a dive coaster by B&M. At 153 feet, it surpasses hang time as the tallest dive coaster in California. Many online critics are hammering their Six Flags like choice of name. So a lot of people have a problem with that. The fact that we've got competing Makos now, East Coast, West Coast, even though 99.3% of people aren't going to care or even know who go to one versus the other having any idea that there are two different Makos. Does that bother you? Personally, I don't care because like... It really doesn't matter what the coaster names are called as long as they're good and they're fun. So actually, they don't really matter about the names. Yeah, a lot of people flip out about that. I don't care if it was called Coaster 1, Coaster 2, Coaster 3, Coaster 4, and they were all painted white. It just really doesn't matter to me. I'm all about the forces and experience. But really interesting, speaking of Six Flags, who we just talked about doing those surveys about dive coasters, that here we are. All these years later, you know, all of a sudden we have these dive coasters popping up out of nowhere. So it's great for SeaWorld San Diego that was struggling. I think that's a great addition for them, and it's not a huge plot of land that it's on. So it's a lot more compact of a dive coaster than Yukon Striker will be. Yeah. So a really good addition for that park. And just odd to have these dive coasters popping up again. But it Yeah, like be... all of a sudden there's been like four in the past couple of years. Yeah, a real resurgence here of the dive coaster. But good news as we really hope the SeaWorlds improve a lot and the attendance gets boosted here 
over the next couple of years as they really are adding a lot of rides. Rumors regarding Disney's newest gem of a ride, Star Wars Rise of the Resistance, have been flowing recently. Ride experience lengths up to 28 minutes, 308 animatronic figures, 50 to 100 stormtroopers, 18 show scenes and five different ride vehicles will make this one of the most expensive and extensive rides in the world. It's really interesting and I know a lot of podcasts have talked about this but this idea of how long this ride is going to be is just amazing. This will probably cost more than Fury did. Or Fury, Millennium Force, and Leviathan combined. Yes, you're completely right. The amount of animatronics going into this the life size at ats. The at ats. That's what I said. You said at ats. At ats. No, you didn't. At ats. Yeah, you said. No, you didn't say that. All the different ride vehicles. It's yeah. just going to be an insane ride. It's just hard to imagine what these lines are going to be like. Seemingly, it's going to break records oh, for the longest so keys of all like time. So, the... like, the. Flight of Passage. You know, yeah. was getting into that five, six, seven, eight hour like range. Like Volcano Bay, like there's some of the airlines got to four hours. This will break records. It'll be like, I guarantee on some Saturday afternoons, it'll get to almost eight hours. Like, I guarantee that. It's Like lines will be going out of the park and stuff. It'll be crazy. It's going to be a scenario where it almost gets to the point where people could go to the park Literally just do one ride. People won't want to stand in the line. So even if people get fast passes, they'll still be waiting in four hour lines because there will be many people coming to this. And after they do it, they'll just get so tired from waiting. They'll just go. Especially in that first year, people are going to want to be part of history and say, I did this ride in this first year. And it's going to break records, I think, in so many ways. And I think this is going to be the ride that really surpasses yeah. the Wizarding World. But then there will still be really long lines at the other attractions at this park, but not as long of lines as this particular one. So that's what I think. I can't wait to see what this is like, but still have many months until it does open up. Yeah. Major props to our friend at Worlds of Fun, Chris Fashi, head of communications, who set the sports world and theme park world on fire for a few days with his viral advertising, transforming the iconic Patriot sign for their B&M invert by covering the OMT up with a CK and a chief symbol, changing it from the Patriot to the Patrick and not to the Chiefs quarterback, Patrick Mahomes. The picture gained so much momentum that it was featured on ESPN, but due to cosmic forces that include some type of witchcraft that keeps Tom Brady young, the sign wasn't enough and the Chiefs lost in overtime. Did I show you that sign? No. Ah, I'll show it to you. Very cool where there's that red, white, and blue Patriot sign for the coaster. Uh Uh-huh. And for the last three letters, they covered up with CK. So instead of Patriots, as in New England Patriots, because it was the Kansas City Chiefs where Worlds of Fun is, Kansas City was playing New England. And so they didn't want to have a ride called Patriot when they're playing the Patriots, right? So that was actually very cool. Let me show it to you now. Pretty clever, right? Yeah, that actually looks pretty cool. It really is. And it was brilliant and just got shared all over the internet. So That's cool. Chris, who we've had on the show before, a very brilliant marketing. Genius. Well, so much has happened in the last couple of days that we'll go off script a little bit for Andrew's news because this has just been crazy. For February, the news popping up all over the place is just insane. And it starts off, first of all, with one of the parks that we go to the most at King's Dominion, which we just found out what? That volcano was closing. That was what? This is... Tuesday, so that was Friday, so it's only been a few days, and I don't think you're that shocked, right? I am, I guess. You are that shocked? Yeah. 
Okay. Last year, it was only open for maybe about a month or so. And even then, closed and open all the time and just completely unreliable. And thankfully, that one day, we did yep. get in line. Did you just do it once ever? Yes, once. Okay. But and you didn't love it? I did. I liked it okay. a lot. What are you talking okay, about? Okay, you liked it a lot. And at least you got that opportunity. And kind of sad because it was such a unique invert, so different. And certain aspects of it I loved. The two launches were great especially that curve around left and then you get that second launch and shoot out the rest of the ride wasn't anything that fascinating but then that drop into the mountain was great so a lot of people are sad it was what just about 20 years old so it wasn't even that old a coaster so many rampant speculations of the mountain being structurally unsound or the launch being unreliable some people saying that parts were used that were not from the manufacturer who knows and I don't think that stuff matters too much, at least not to me. But it's sad that it'll be gone. And a lot of people are hoping that the mountain will still be able to use because it's so iconic there. But who knows? Would you like to see the mountain stay? Yeah. I mean, like, they've already had, like, four or five things in there. They could make, like, a mellow or dark ride in there or something. If it's still structurally sound enough to yeah. do it. Yeah, we know the Smurfs ride was in there and there yeah. was a log flume ride that was in there as well. Hopefully that means that in the next couple of years they will have another big addition to replace it. Twisted Timbers was great last year, but hopefully they will have a new addition in the next couple of years to fill in for that. But certainly a sad day for a lot of King's Dominion members. I haven't heard there was a petition that was put in, but that stuff is so silly. Like Kenny Wood with their log jammer. Uh, you know, you can't petition to keep a ride that is not financially viable or sustainable anymore. Well, then we also had some news about Bush Gardens Williamsburg with their now potential launch coaster that could have a spike over 300 feet tall, which is pretty insane for their 2020 project, as maybe it isn't going to be that flagpole like the president of the park talked about at the Coaster Radio meetup. So that sounds pretty insane, right? Yeah, that, that would be cool. Like a launch that goes into a big top hat, but instead of doing a top hat, it just rolls back. And so rolling back, yeah, 300 feet would be pretty insane at some point. And I love that fact that it's going to be a unique, original, different coaster, and that's kind of exciting. So details right now are pretty limited, but still just to find out that it's not going to be a star flyer or something like that yeah. uh, is exciting, if all that is true. I think those were competing stories on the same day last Friday of those two things coming out, so it was kind of like a high point and low point at the same time. Well, I just mentioned to you as well, it's whether fun. it's brilliant trolling or whatever it is, that job description from King's oh, Island yeah, that, that stated funny. that they needed someone in potential management or supervisor who could do what? Who could climb up 400 feet. Which led or to, more. Yeah, or more. Rampant speculation of, oh, does that mean King's Island's going to have a 400 foot tall I bet that one, lift hill coaster? Or Yeah, I bet that made the coaster always crazy. Oh, uh, there's a lot of talk now. Or is it going to be a drop or some other type coaster? Or is it just trolling? Or is it me- meaning that some people might have to work at Cedar Point? I, there's just all sorts of speculation there, but... Until we know more, I don't think there's much discussion there. But also, in the last couple of days, there was some artwork released for the new Hagrid coaster that is being built. And the majority of it is through the forest, as was speculated. So some of that artwork looks really cool, but still very little news from Universal about it at all at this point. So I have a feeling that this year or next year, will be the year we get to Universal, as both you and Alex yeah, like this will, will be able, either this summer or next summer, because I want both of you to be at the 54 inches so you can ride everything. Alex will definitely be by, at 54 by that time. By next summer? By this summer. By this summer, okay. Well, he's getting pretty close. The Halloween season started a little oddly for us. And it started actually at Darien Lake, funny enough. And do you remember who went that day? It was you, me, Maddie. And Maddie at that point, she's a little, about three and a half. (laughs) And we just decided to go. Alex and Melissa were busy with something. And the three of us decided to go. And at that point, I was imp- I had no idea. I was very impressed Darien Lake actually had a Fright Fest at all. Because really yeah. at that point, what do they have, a couple of months to prepare? Look at you giggling. Why are you giggling at poor Darien Lake? No reason. Oh no, you're, you're just feeling happy? I guess. I like it. 
they had so little time to prepare for it, and I thought it was very cute for what it was. We didn't go through any of the houses because they were like pay per house. So well, even if it was pay us per house, even if they said, "Hey, go through the house and we'll give you ten bucks." With Maddie, a three-year-old, I'm not I going through a house. I would have done that. You would have gotten paid All for you it. could do is, like, zipper her up in a jacket or, or close her eyes and close her ears, and she would have been fine. And scar her for the rest of the life and pay no, for counseling. And she she would have her ears closed and her eyes closed, so she wouldn't oh hear gosh. or see anything. Have her ears closed. I've never heard anyone say that. I don't know how she closes her ears. <laughs> yeah, stick her fingers in her ears and not hear anything. But one of the disappointments was the section of the park that was actually closed. Now, we had only been to Darien Lake once before when we saw Green Day a couple years ago. And what was the sad section that was closed that we didn't get to do? It was all that section of the park with Moo Moo Mr. Cow. Moo Moo Mr. Cow, Moose on the Loose? Yes. Yes, Moo Moo Mr. Cow, Moose on the Loose. So that was all closed. And since we had Maddie, we weren't able to do Tantrum. We'll do that next year. Yeah, as it's a, not like our number one priority for I'm, this minute. Yeah, you did Hydris already, which is yeah. the same exact thing at the Jersey Shore. So no big deal. But we had a really nice time there. We did a number of different rides, including like the parachute rides. We did the Ferris wheel with her. We did the antique cars with her. Yeah. A number of cute little rides. And I was happy about that. Although, holy cow, getting in, it was crazy. Because they looked at us when we had our Six Flags passes like they had never seen them before. That we were completely unsure of where to go. We had to go to a completely different entrance where they were able to access her stuff and then getting our meals was an, a whole nother ordeal and I'm sure a lot of that will be patched up next year as they really go into the year as an official Six Flags Park but they had four themed areas Scream Punk near Ride of Steel that had a couple people yeah uh, there. <laughs> but Maddie got scared by a couple of different scare actors like that um, werewolf one yeah she was a little nervous in that area they had the voodoo curse near the Ferris wheel and that little house got me because we saw it earlier and you're I like even uh, told you, you did you did and a woman pulled the curtain away from one of the windows and she got me pretty nicely there while well, I was holding and Maddie. Maddie. Creep Show Freak Show was by Predator there. That's where they had all the carnival stuff and where the actual haunt got started. And there were some really cool people, I thought, in interesting costumes in that area. And Passage of the Damned by the entrance walkway. And that's where we were heading out. And that guy got you pretty badly. And the funny no? thing... Yeah, as he came behind you. And, yeah. uh, and then the well. funny thing is, he walked all the way to the entrance and actually didn't he get one of the entrance employees yeah. who was like greeting people coming in and he like went like an inch behind her and she was like ah! it was pretty cool that he came that far out they had the three attraction houses at that point that they were able to throw together Hotel Terror in the Pavilion Camp Scumshine in the Viper Line and Jungle Apocalypse behind Viper it was I thought as good as it could be for having a couple of months and they had some cool theming and red blood in the fountain and then way back then I did a social media post because that was when Brian and Tim were going to Universal Orlando yeah. and I did a post like are you guys jealous? You know, we have a red fountain. You guys are going to what was some of those houses? Oh, uh, there was a Halloween house or Stranger Things house or was what's that one movie with the ghost? Poltergeist. Poltergeist. Which are three of the greatest houses I've ever had and we had a red fountain. So, but it was very cute and we'll see how it progresses next year. Well, then we had a weekend that we had planned to go to Ohio to get to Kings Island and Cedar Point to do their haunts and get on a coaster that was going to be closing. But it was also the same weekend as Phoenix Fall Fun Fest and Clint and Sherry had told us they were going and so they're rarely ever able to come up north. And we told them, now nah, we've got to go to Ohio. We had this planned out and we really want to get Andrew that Firehawk credit out there. We were thinking about it that Friday night and we're like oh, okay you know let's let's we'll do Pennsylvania we'll go to Ohio later on so it's that Saturday morning of Phoenix Fall Fun Fest and we hadn't been back to Knobles since the coaster radio meetup so we went that Saturday morning and texted Clint and said yeah so how is it there what's the weather like and are there a lot of people there and it was early before the event started and I was just saying where are you now and he texted the international dining place sort of near Phoenix then he texted wait are you guys coming and then we were right there and surprised them 
and yeah. and so it was kind of neat. And at that point, I think that's where you guys did a video of you riding. What did you ride? Like a little horsey carousel. Yeah. And I think that made the in the loop video for the Phoenix Fall Fun Fest, including a lot of other things that we did. It worked out really well because Clint and Sherry like to do a lot of rides, and that's pretty much what we do all day at the park. We'll take a break for meals here and there, but otherwise we are going ride to ride to ride. And the fun thing about it is we finally got to do a number of things at Knobles that we've never done before. Because generally we'll do Phoenix and Twister like 10 times each. And so it doesn't leave a lot of time. So that was kind of the cool thing about that. Coasters, we did Impulse and Clint absolutely loved it and Sherry did as well. Oh, that, and loved the restraints. My legs. See, that's the funny thing is that Clint was like, these are the best like restraints. Kind of like so uh, Goliath bad. is the same way. Goliath said they're the most comfortable restraints ever. Love them. And so they bothered you this time a lot. Yes. Feels like they were trying to chop off my legs. Yeah, which is bad. Being that you're saying that, I'm, I'll be fascinated to see this year what you think of Sky Rush. If that bothers you as much. Because that's one of the coasters this year I'm most excited about you getting on Sky Rush and, and Superman at New England. We did Phoenix twice and great timing as it was just named the number one wooden coaster in the world for the Golden Ticket Awards. So that was kind of interesting timing. But then after that, we finally got to Twister and did that a few times. And what did you think of the difference in Twister? It's a lot smoother. They did some major retracking on that. One of my favorite wooden coasters, definitely in my top whatever, 20, I'd say. And I've always loved it. And it's always been a tad bit rough, never brutal. The double helix was always a little rough. There's a curve near the tunnel early on that was always pretty rough where you curve to the right. But I always still loved it. But what a difference. A few people said that GCI did some retracking and it was like a totally different coaster. And I said to a lot of people, wow, Phoenix is rated number one, but this cements it for me that in that park I like Twister better than Phoenix. What? I thought it was just, it was riding Actually, so Actually, I gotta say I do too because it's more intense. You don't get as much airtime, which a lot of coaster boys, that's why they say they like Phoenix better. But it's just so good now that they retract it. <sighs> so good. And it's interesting that you say that because I don't really know if Twister has any airtime. I can't really think of too many moments, but I never really think yeah, of it. Yeah, I don't but, really think it has that much. And it's such a unique coaster. I can't say that we've ever done a wooden coaster that I'd say is like Twister. Well, no? no. I mean, the, Viper kind of? I think that's a great example. I know that's supposed to be a Cyclone copy. Funny that yeah. when I said I can't think of anything that's close, Viper did pop in my head, and it is as smooth. So we did Flying Turns at the end of the night, which is always still a fun ride, and I'm glad Clinton Sherry got their credit on that, but that's always kind of the longest line as that takes a while. Takes and, so long. And Black Diamond. I think uh, Sherry especially really appreciated the theming yeah, of Black Diamond. Fun. Yep. So then we did flyer that day and we were together for that. And then Clint and Cherry had their own flyers. And it's amazing how high you can get on those things. You remember that we hit the branches? Well, we didn't quite hit them, but we were... They're almost in the trees. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and Cherry, do you remember, actually she stopped the ride. At, yeah. yeah. And she actually got yelled at for going too high and turning sideways. Her flyer turned like almost completely around. And she said, I can't help it. And she's lighter in the wind. It, I think it was kind of a windy day. Day, yeah, and uh, that the wind really pushed her. Well, right after that, we did a ride that we've always seen and thought was interesting, a looper that yeah. you and Clint went on one, and Sherry and I, who were both interested <laughs> not getting dizzy, so we're like, oh, we're not going to. Well, flip. I've we'll done that on once it. with um, you did? Mark. Oh, that's right. So when you did it with Mark, Eb's son, did you guys ever flip? Oh yeah, we flipped a bunch. Okay, so you did, and I think Clint said that was his first time on it, and I saw yeah. you guys flipped a bunch. Do you like that ride? Yeah, it's so fun because I don't get dizzy, and it's so unique and different. Yeah, so you guys flipped a bunch, and that's great that you got to do that. After that, we did Paratrooper, which we've never done before. And wow, was that a long cycle, right? Yeah. Holy cow, I that can't believe how long that was. five minutes. And I guess it makes sense. At a park like that, where probably the majority of people are doing tickets, it makes yeah, sense like to have a long cycle. Ride, so. Right, if you're paying per ride, you don't want to have a minute ride, and that's it. That is a long cycle. Whereas, like, like Six Flags or Cedar Fair, like, they would have shorter because it's not pay per ride. Yeah, they would have much longer lines exactly yep. well next up was my surprise of the trip and you've done it a number of times and i never did it for a number of reasons whether i was watching maddie or something else but the stratosphere their drop tower that clint took some video for in the loop and what an amazing drop ride that is yeah so i really didn't realize what that was like where you get to the top and unlike others where you stop and you can regroup and then expect that fall what does it do at the top there Falls. 
So without pausing at all, you get to the top and it just falls. And what a forceful drop it is. So even though it's not even 200 feet, it turns out to be one of the coolest drop rides there is. That first time reaction of people who've never done it before is pretty cool. That they really let out a sound when they go down that. So we did it twice in a row. It was just so much fun. We did their super roundup, their swashbuckler version at Great Adventure. First time we did it there in the pitch black and that was a lot of fun. Then we did the Cosmotron, which is cool because it goes backwards. It's, a lot of them don't go backwards anymore, those indoor Himalaya rides. And so I like the fact that it goes backwards, right? That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. We did their antique car ride in the daytime. Yep. So we didn't do it with the actors because that line gets so long at night. But yeah, still, and we had to pay extra for it. Which wouldn't be a problem because I heard it's a cool experience. But at that point, the line was too long and we want to get one more Phoenix ride in. Those bumper cars are just insane. We did bumper car ride and that was just crazy. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's violent, just, right? Yeah. And then we did the Grand Carousel, which is always voted the number one carousel in America. And it was my first time doing it at Knobles. And the first ride, I got the brass ring. So I was psyched about that. And I posted it on social media. Such a fun element to have that, even if you don't win. Because it's just luck, right? No, it's skill. It's cause skill. Because you have to reach, be able to reach out. Well, another part of the In The Loop video that Clint took was us going down the sky slide for the first time. That was boring. Oh my gosh. Was it slow for you too? Yeah, he's like, I barely went two miles per hour. Yeah, so it looks so cool, that old metal rocket type slide where you go around the outside spiraling down. But it's good to say we've done it and probably don't need to do it again. But it's a classic part of Knobles. You could probably go down on a plastic slide and go faster. Probably. That's a very good point. It was a great day and we were there from opening till closing and that was a ton of fun and so good to hang out with Clinton Sherry as we don't get to see them all that much. After that we went to the Jersey Shore to hang out that night and always good to get down to the shore. That next day we decided to head over to Dorney to do their whole haunt. A couple years ago we were there and just did a couple of the houses. Yeah they've changed it a lot I think. We did that other time just a couple houses and we wanted to be able to get all of them done. So we were there in time for haunt starting which was Overlord's Resurrection yeah. that starts near Meteor right there. That was pretty cool. That's well done. You've got yeah. the actor who's dressed like a demon who lip syncs the whole thing like I'm sure happens at every single park which is fine and it was very cool because we saw our buddy Steve there who's a great supporter of the show and it was great to see him and hang out with him uh, for a little bit while we waited for the shows to start and he was there with his friend coming all the way out from the Midwest in the Chicago area. Very cool to talk to him. He had one of the fast passes for the haunt, so he went around a lot quicker than we could since we didn't have that. So we decided to head out to Urgent Scare to start things off, which are near the flyers at Dorney, kind of where Stinger was in that general area back there. So that was our first house. And it was cool waiting in line. We actually got a gift from someone. Yeah, somebody just gave us a random football because I guess they didn't want it. And it was a Syracuse football. Yeah, and so it was kind of funny because we're not that far from Syracuse, about an hour and a half. So it was cool. Someone won a football, didn't want to carry it around. Didn't we hide it in a bush for the night? Because we didn't want to carry it around from haunt to haunt, so we just hid it in a bush and got it at the end of the night. Kind of a nice start to the night. Urgent scare. I thought it was... That was cute. It's like basically a clone like every single other podcast. Because, I mean, there's we've already done like three or two. One of my favorite rooms in there was the room where there are a bunch of bodies standing up and they're all covered in plastic, like 12 in a row. And you know one of them's going to be an yeah. actor. And that's the concern of which one it's going to be. And so there was a lot of energy for that first one. I thought the actors did a great job. I mean, when I was done with that, it was my favorite. Because it was you were one for one at that point. Yeah. I think my only problem with that one is there are a lot of fake bodies made out of plastic and I think those houses that have a lot of those kind of props are just not my favorite because or like rubber because they look so fake and I understand that in every room you can't have five actors so you have to have some of that stuff it's a lot cheaper that way but in that way it marks it down a little bit
it for me. After that, we headed over to Necropolis. Now, this is near the Chloride Revolution, and I always saw this one because it's outside and they prepare it early, and I yeah. always thought that was an interesting one because the queue is outside and it's a lot bigger, and I knew nothing about it, and it was weird. When we were waiting in the ride for this, it was so troubling. There was a couple there, and they both were holding toddlers. One of them was like one, and one of them was like two and a half, and I just thought that was very weird to bring kids that young to an event like that. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. And I, and I understand sometimes having babysitters or family near you, if you don't have them, it's tough. But it just seems like that's not the best event for little tiny kids. Yeah, definitely not. It's kind of interesting because you queue outside and then you go through this arch into the cemetery that they have. And the cemetery was gigantic. There were these huge gravestones yeah. everywhere. It was very realistic. Like they had smoke and it was at least hundred, hundreds of yards. Oh my gosh, yeah, they had tons of gravestones. And you're right, the smoke and the lighting created a really cool effect. And what was interesting about it is that you really couldn't tell where exactly you were supposed to go. There wasn't a path because of all the gravestones and stuff. Yeah, some of the scare actors who are kind of like zombies, sort of, they kind of steer you at times where you need to go. And then from there you head into a tomb where it's like a long hallway. A catacomb. Yeah, and there were a couple of things in there. A catacomb, I think that's perfectly stated. And I think at the end of it, there was this blinding light. And I think it might have been a bungee actors who springs at you. Yeah. And I thought that was such a cool effect. I really liked that one. I thought that was so very different than a lot of other haunts, and it looked nothing like a lot of the others. So really enjoyed Necropolis. I thought that was great. From there, as we headed in a logical direction, we went to Trick or Treat Lights Out, which is right underneath the lift hill for Steel Force. And this was our first ever Lights Out kind of one where, what do they give you? Flashlight. Yeah. For haunts, one of my suggestions is to try to either be first or last. I completely disagree. Oh my gosh. And so all the time I tried to finagle it so in terms of where we were to try to be either first or last because I, I mean, that's like, what I love. With that I would want to be like the first because then I get to control the light and see where all the characters are and where we're going and where everything is. But also then that means you're showing the scare actors when you're coming and stuff. So they know. Generally, if you're in the front or the back, you get a lot more action. I know they try to spread I, out. Well, you, whenever we're in the back, in some scenes, you'll wait for close to 30 seconds for mm -hmm. like, the people in front of us to go. Well, sometimes that's really cool. If you're in the back, yeah, then you can like be your own group where you're completely by yourself, which you love, right? No, I hate that. <laughs> Ah, which is great. To me, this was the biggest disappointment because with the lights out, you really couldn't see any of the theming And there's only all. like one or two scare actors in there. It yeah. Like it's weird. They might not have had all their actors yet at that point, but there were two scare actors and neither of them actually said anything that they both were kind of just motioning. Normally in those kind of houses when we've gone and it's like a witch thing, they love to talk to you. They love yeah. to say things like, oh, a little boy for my special soup or something. Something like that. They do. They say things like that. Oh, I love little trick-or-treaters. <laughs> so, stuff like that. But they didn't say anything. You really couldn't see much, and we didn't get scared by anything, so that one was a little disappointing. Well, next up was, I think what's generally the most popular one there, Corn Stalkers, which is by Demon Drop. And this was our longest line. That was yeah. probably 40... Hour. Yeah, 45 minutes, I was going to say. Uh, and it was an hour. And you think it was an hour. Pretty long line, but at least they had scare actors who walk along it and just talk to people. Actor. Yeah, I remember the one really big guy who was there. I think both of us really loved this one. He Re was funny. Oh, he was funny. But then when we actually got in, it's pretty elaborate. It's a very long maze. Yeah. And a lot of different parts to it and different places for people to jump out. Yeah, like it's, it's supposed to be like about a family and their Farmers. Oh, yes. Very different from the one at King's Dominion, which is just complete corn everywhere that you're walking through. This, that one wasn't as good. Yeah, I think this one had more variety to it, so I really enjoyed it. Some really cool scenes and you know, different animals. They and, liked making loud noises, that's for sure. And there were loud noises. Then we did Chamber of Horrors Wax Museum, which we had done before, but I think there were a couple different scenes. Yeah, they were... A lot of different scenes, I'd say. I remember we walked past a car, car that it, did it honk. Yeah, right. Honked. It honked, and I thought that one was pretty interesting. Some really cool scenes and a lot of actors like in that one. A lot of fake outs that were yes that looked like they're wax, but they're not. Like this one girl, she looked so realistic. 
like she was a wax figure, but yeah, she like was the really good. Was perfect. But even the guy who welcomes you in, like I knew he was there because I saw him in the previous group, and then we walked in, and I was talking to you, and he completely got me and as I forgot he was there but I thought that was great then the biggest surprise to me was Blackout which is kind of in that same area yeah. and I loved these I thought I was gonna really dislike them because I like theming in a haunt so much Yeah. and I was shocked at how much I loved it where you just have the little arrows that point you all over the place but what are some of those scares that you get in a Blackout kind of haunt there would be like, people that are all dressed in black that would uh, they wouldn't like how at you or scream like some of the other actors do in other haunts because that's just kind of mean because right. you can't see anything but they'll whisper in your ear or something there's these like, wind gusts at your feet yes and like they actually make me jump because <laughs> the wind hits me and i like jump not because i'm scared just because i'm afraid well but it's but, loud too that that rush yeah. of air that comes out is loud and i think out of any of the haunts it's these blackouts that has the most screaming because people are so scared because they know it's dark and just anything freaks them out. There will be things hanging from the ceiling that touch you sometimes. Taurus Trap, we had a little bit of a line, but it took 15 minutes. But it was not the length of the line, but what happened in line that was troubling. Do you remember what issues we had there? Yep, you can explain it. Yeah, kind of frustrating where we had a couple of people who were line cutters and who, oh, my family is up there, both of them stated. And a lot of people were upset, even though the line wasn't that long, and contact security. And the security walked over to the house and who knows what happened after that. But it's just always frustrating that type of thing. Yeah. You know, why your family should come back to you, not you should walk up to your family. And Taurus Trap, it was okay. There was some really cool theming inside, some yeah. beautiful scenes, but nothing that really stuck out in terms of scare actors that I yeah, thought was like, anything incredible. It would actually have a lot of things that were in a hotel but a little bit scarier, I'd say. Yep. There are a couple weird scenes, like, I don't know, just random things. Yeah, it was okay, but a little on the shorter side. And then finally after that we did Blood on the Bayou that we moved through pretty quickly. Yeah, we and, did that one. But some cool scenes like the giant guy in the bed who's yeah, having that's... some issues. And it smells bad. Right? Oh, yeah, they do a good job with not only the sounds of what's Older. happening to him and his digestive system, but some Older. smells. Yeah. I think at the end there's the giant gator as well. Yeah, I like it because they theme this one very well. Yep, I agree. A variety of different things. You're walking through swamps at one point in a house. I'm not sure why you'd walk through a swamp in a house, but it happens. And really cool makeup because you have all those voodoo type people with really cool makeup jobs. So we always kind of like that one. The last week of Haunt, we headed to Ohio after that and hit up Cedar Point first on a Friday. And it was weird because they had super short hours for a haunt that night. Like it was either something like 5 to 10 or 5 to 11. So it was a really short kind of day. And we got there right at opening. And we had time in the beginning. And the funny thing with that, with it being open for those hours, we only rode three coasters that day. Yeah. And they were right at the beginning there. So you remember which one we started with? Millennium Force. And what was it like weather-wise, do you remember? No. It was really cold and, and actually kind of raining a little bit. So it was a little wet, and we did a social media post of probably being around 40 degrees and misting as a pretty tough last ride from Millennium yeah. Force. But it was fun. And still, the park at that point was pretty dead. So we headed back to the park, and what other two coasters did we do next? Steel Vengeance? Yeah. We did Steel Vengeance and Maverick were our other two. And still had great rides on both of them. Yep. So at that point, once we did the three of those coasters, and the first two, Maverick and Millennium Force, had no line at all, Steel Vengeance had a bit of a line. Certainly that might have taken us more like 45 minutes, half hour at that point. And right after we did Steel Vengeance, it was pretty much time for Haunt to start. So we got in line to Cornstalkers, which is in their raft ride area. Yeah, they do it in the raft ride. Pretty much you do in that area, and then the path goes kind of through right next to the trench yeah. for large parts of it. And that was another one where they had a couple of scare actors in line yeah, that was to two. entertain you. Their masks were creepy. Yeah, really well done. 
and that was excellent. Didn't they do an announcement to start the hot off? Well, I forgot what he said, but... Exactly, they announced it to let people know that they were going to open the line yeah, and, and it's starting. Yeah, and I think they yep. do one for every single house because this one said Corn Stalkers is now opening up. Like it was Why a recorded message? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So interesting that they record those. But I like the fact, again, that compared to we just talked about Corn Stalkers for King's Dominion versus Dorney, and this one was different than both of those. This one wasn't as good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was like a straight line, the whole thing. Yeah, and there were no, like, sets. It was just literally just corn and stuff. And I think, like King's Dominion, there were people who were dressed in the corn to hide themselves. And that was, I think, one of the strongest parts of this maze, is that you did have a lot of people who blended into the corn perfectly, so that... And there were, like... There was one, like, really tall guy. Not on stilts, though, just who happened to be super tall, right? I doubt it. It was still interesting, even though it was pretty much completely straight and had some good scares to it with those corn people popping out. Well, then, logistically, Slaughterhouse, which is right underneath Millennium Force's first turn, we did Slaughterhouse next. And that line was a little bit long. And it was just amusing as we waited in that line to see all of the people who were getting freaked out by what person who had what. Oh, it was a fake chainsaw. Yeah, so a chainsaw guy with a mask on, I think. These chainsaws, I think, are a little cheesy, not scary, because what are they compared? It's just a recording of a chainsaw, and it's... I don't even know what he's holding. A chainsaw with, like, a part of it without a blade or something? Well, it's supposed to look like a chainsaw, and right, we've been to haunts before where they just have a regular chainsaw, but then it doesn't have a blade. But I guess the issue with that is it spews fumes everywhere and kind of smells gross and smoke and all that. So now they have these chainsaws that are battery-based and... Sound. Is, is that with every park or just a... I think that most chains par- chain parks probably have those kind now so as to not make people cough and all that. But people were so freaked out and they were running down the path. He'd hide by the exit door. They'd walk out the exit door and walk about 15 feet and then he'd run behind them and people were just freaking out and running. You didn't like that guy too much when we were finished either. I didn't run oh, from him. Okay, all right, tough guy. All right. I have to say, you did a lot better this year because we talked about how Haunts worked in the past where he'd grab onto the back of my jacket and bury his head in my back and I occasionally look up. No, this year you were much braver. No, I Not I mean, I didn't bury before. my head into your jacket. <laughs> no, no, no. Nothing like that at all. Slaughterhouse I thought was okay. There were some really good actors in there. But again, a lot of those rubber body parts. Some of it animals and some of it humans. And I thought there were some pretty good scares. The actors were excellent. but I like the actor masks. Like, there would be, like, dead-looking deer things and pig things that looked very cool. And I think some of the sets were there would be, like, fake people that are strapped down into a bed and then it looked like the scare actors would be cutting them with a chainsaw. Some of those props were cool. Exactly. I thought that was kind of interesting and certainly a very popular one. After that, we went to Fear Ground Freak Show, which is right by Maverick. That's in that circular building there. And it used to be a hospital one. Yeah, it used to be basically... Urgent scare. Yeah, uh, probably the same exact thing, exactly. I really like this one because of the carnival barker that you had in front, who was this talking to people. He had a microphone probably or megaphone. my second favorite out of all of them. Interesting, that okay. And so that guy was really entertaining. He would talk to people in an accent and ask them where they were from and kind of make fun of them. And that helped in the line a little bit to at least yeah, be entertained because those guys were funny. Like... This line was like one hour long at least. That was a long line. It wrapped all the way around to the swings and back. So that one definitely took a little bit longer. But some really cool props inside. Some giant heads. And there were just really cool sets of different carnival-like things. Yeah, I, and it I would be it like really outside the building, they'd show and starring the three-bodied boy or the lizard boy. Man, or uh, there are a lot of boys. Big Bessie. With, yeah, boys with three bodies. That's a crazy <laughs> carnival act. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of freak show. And in the line, we we play this little game. It's like a quiz. The charades on the phone. You're yeah, talking about, charades. Right? Yeah, yeah. And one of the characters came up behind us and said, "Like, what are you playing?" Or something like. That. And just kind of played along with that. Yeah. And yeah, so that was very cool. I really liked it. Some really cool looking sets and some like shrunken heads and those kind of things. It was a very interesting haunt that way. Yeah. Uh, just with a lot of those carnival sets that I thought looked cool. 
Well, then we did Deprivation, which is in the Steel Vengeance queue. And I actually it, did that one more because there were three different paths that you could go on. And it was incredible. I loved it. I wish we had more time to do it again. It was so entertaining and really a lot more of those air shooters that went off and it felt really long. I really love Deprivation. Those blackout ones are great. Well, then as we were walking back to the front of the park, you remembered, thankfully, about the one haunt that's in that actual well, house. Well, no, that actually, we did there. it because we were just walking to the little kids area because we knew that a lot of the haunts had little candy things that they would give out to kids. Yep. And so we were walking oh, over. Snoopy, that Snoopy area, the yeah. one in front. Yeah. And we were going there, and then all of a sudden we bumped into that house, and we were like, oh, yeah, we forgot about that and, and if we didn't do that then we would have forgotten about the best house that we've done oh okay so you're on that boat as well okay and that was ga bockling's mm -hmm. eerie estate it's right off the main midway and it was terrific the line wasn't that long moved pretty quickly and this was my favorite house of all the haunts it was so incredibly long it was very well themed a lot of different rooms in it and the cool part about it was the line always weaved in and out and changed directions. There weren't very many long straight sort of paths. It just kept going yeah. on and on forever. And This one was long. It was great. So long and so well developed. They had so many props in each room that it really yeah. looked like a house that had been yeah, there forever. The sets were great because it looked like it had like every part of a house. It was fantastic. And it had some of the coolest mm -hmm. things that I remember. There was this one room and I don't think you remembered it because I mentioned it to you a little bit after and you didn't remember. It was sort of like three giant cotton balls, what it looked like. It looked like a big chair made out of these giant cotton balls, and it was completely stationary. And I had a feeling when I looked at it, and then the guy popped up, and it was someone in costume. And it looked so cool, and it wasn't it wasn't supposed to be menacing, but it was just a cool idea. Maybe you could show me if there's a video. Yeah, we that. can check it out. Not many houses have full POVs. Well, I think I can, Cedar Point I can will see. have. Oh, there's a lot of coaster points Okay, there. well, they don't really like people filming those so that's the problem with that <laughs> then there was as we were going and we were already in our fifth or sixth room i remember we were going through a room where there was a piano and i said to you oh my gosh this is such a long house and then the woman who was seated at the piano said yes it is very long and you'll be here for a long time and she started playing a song and it was just very cool they had a lot of different rooms that connected to other rooms so a scare actor could scare you in one room and then pop over to the next one as well and just loved it and i hope that that's one that's kept around for a couple years because uh, we'll definitely go to that one again next year. So uh, just absolutely my favorite. After that, we went to the one that is near Gatekeeper, Hex Lights Out. And it was kind of very similar to Trick or Treat where, again, there weren't many scare actors. We had one of the lights and there weren't many scares in that one at all. And you really didn't see much, remember? Which one? Hexed one, the one that uh, you did with yeah. Alex. Uh, a couple years ago, but yeah. it was okay. But and again, we the, had the light. I yeah, think. Yes, we did again. We had the there light. There was one good jump scare that I remember. But I, but similarly, I remember that the actors again in this one were pretty mellow and didn't really say much. Yeah. Uh, like 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 that was part of the script. And then we finished with Zombie High, which I thought was okay. Yeah, it was. One of the best zombie highs that we did. I'd say I liked it better than King's Dominions because it was a little more intricate and wasn't one giant building that was just separated with lockers or desks. So you felt a little more isolated in certain rooms. And like the cafeteria and the dance scene and a couple yeah. of other things were pretty cool. I thought Zombie High was okay. We walked through Blood on the Bayou and it had way fewer actors this recent haunt than it had in previous ones. Yeah, we really didn't see was... many actors at all. But it was really late in the night too, so possibly that's it. I at that point, we decided, as they closed up, to drive at least a little bit towards Mason. And that was the night of the World Series, where it was that 17-inning World Series game. So as we were driving and you fell asleep in the car, I put it on and was listening. Then we got to the hotel, and at that point, I was like, oh my gosh, I've invested this much time into it. And then I kept watching it for a while, and then eventually I just had to fall asleep because we still had a couple hours to drive the rest of the way to Kings Island. We got to Kings Island pretty much at open, and this is one of the best parts of the trip because it's always about the people as we say and our great friend Chris from Columbus and Jordan and Sarah were there as well as Steve the icy trio the only one missing from the icy quartet was who? Reese Reese 
who's in Virginia. So it was so great to see them because they were our buddies who we all hung out with them at the Silver Dollar City meetup. And they've turned out to be great friends of ours as their contributors to Coaster Radio as well. And when we got to the front, as it was the last literal day of Haunt, you remember what was weird about the decorations at that point? Oh, at, they at already Island? started setting up for Christmas. So that was the funny part that we took a picture at the entrance where you were in front of a hearse and a Christmas tree. Almost yeah. like Nightmare Before Christmas a little bit. Yeah. So that was kind of funny. The first bunch of hours there were all about us getting our rides in. And we did Banshee, which didn't bother your legs as much this time, right? No, it is a little bit taller. better, but I still noticed it. Yeah, hopefully that'll get better and better each year for you. For the first time ever, I got to do Drop Zone there, which I love. Yeah. Not quite as forceful as the King's Mini one. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree, but that one spins, so you can see the whole park. Which is very cool. That's a great point. As you're going up the tower, you spin, so you can look all over the place, including the tennis center that's there, where they have the pro tournament just across the highway. And it was the first time I did Delirium, and the guys told me that that was the first model. That was the prototype of those rides. So Delirium, I thought, was really fun. We did Adventure Express a couple times is they adore it. They all have their funny rituals that they do when they go in the tunnels and all that. It's uh, kind of amusing. We did Steve's beloved Vortex. I think he might be the only member of the Vortex Lovers fan club. Yep. Or are you a member well, of that club? Well, there are probably some King Island fanboys that also adore it. I like it. I think if you know how to brace and keep yeah, your head from bashing, at your height it's a little harder, but I think it's a fun ride. I have no problem with it. We did Racer, and I thought Racer was pretty smooth. I thought, yeah, that's I thought great. It, I thought it was doing great. And then The Beast, which we did back car, middle row, non-wheel seat. Love Beast more and more every time we do it. And then we got on Bat and Mystic Timbers, and that was our longest wait of the day, as that was probably about 45 minutes. At the point where Haunt was about to start, we were in the back of the park by racer there where urgent scare was our first haunt of the day and i felt bad jordan was very nice about not loving haunts it wasn't his thing but he was fine with us going and our first one urgent scare we didn't have that much of a wait for and it was kind of an interesting setting do you remember where their urgent scare was it's in their theater type thing yeah it's like yeah, where like, the like 3d or 4d movies are which where... they never use i've never seen them use it exactly no there it's never been used for anything i'm sure it's been a Maybe number they of years just use it for the haunt I yeah guess. That's and it. that might be it completely i thought it was interesting because as you walk there they had all the stuff like in the yard and thrown all over the place yeah. hospital things like didn't they have a skeleton on a stretcher yeah, and then, yeah, like, a lot of different bloody bodies. So a little bit more separation between rooms in this urgent scare. I thought this one was pretty cool and had some yeah. interesting scares to it. And the next up one was one of the most interesting ones of the day to me. And that was Madame Fatale's Cavern of Terror. And Steve actually wanted to join us for that one because of where it was. Do you remember what building that one was in? Yeah, it was in their building they closed. Close. Where their top spin Where was, top spin which was supposed to be such a cool ride. We had never been in there before, and it was so interesting. Just the cute where you go inside and there's like some bamboo and skeletons and kind of stuff yeah. and then you go into that holding room where the giant circular door used to move and close and then when you go into that next holding room remember the animatronic there's, that was in there yeah it what was, was like it? a gargoyle type thing yeah so cool and it actually did move right and so that was awesome and you get to see i think we peeked in a little bit to see the inside ride room where you can sort of see you get a little feel for it because right on the wall there was some kind of giant statue it. Yeah, it's hard to see because it was dark in there. But I thought the haunt itself was Maybe pretty cool. Maybe next year if they go, they'll turn the lights on. That would be really interesting. And we can even check out a POV to see yeah. what it looked like. I thought it was interesting. They had a lot of small little rooms where they would have different freaks and that kind of thing, right? Wasn't that yeah. the theme of that? Yeah, it was just really neat to see that building. And I thought that one was pretty interesting. Well, then after that, right by the Eiffel Tower, they had an, an outdoor maze by the Backwoods Bayou. And I don't really remember too much much in that one it was right on the side oh, of the yeah. eiffel tower that one was, eh. there wasn't a lot there i yeah, don't think they no. had a ton of things there so that didn't leave much of an impression the next haunt we went to was also kind of cool more so for just the building as opposed to the haunt itself and that was wolf pack and that was cool because where was that one it's in the sun of beast station 
And so that was kind of neat because, as Steve pointed out, that there's a last little bit of Son of Beast track that going into the station you see about five feet yeah. worth of Son of Beast track. And it's like, oh, that of course we never get to do that. We got into this hobby after that, sadly. But Wolfpack, I thought, was kind of interesting. There were a number of scare actors in there with different levels of wolf costumes wow, I on. I actually disagree. I didn't think there were that many. I think there were a couple who had, like, full wolf costumes on. Yeah, I think There were there stationary were, yeah. fake wolves, too. But I think the highlight of that haunt was the ending of it. Yeah, it was like a big animatronic wolf. That was probably, what, four feet high by three foot? And it actually moved and it growled and had red eyes? Yeah, and I saw somebody controlled it from the back. Oh, okay, so it was pushed by someone, yeah. yeah. Okay, so really neat. Well, then in that same area, we also did their blackout. And again, I just had a ton of fun in that blackout as well. Yeah, that one was weird because you, like, had to hold on to a rope. Oh, yes, great memory. And it was very loud in there. Super loud. Everyone in your group had to hold on to the rope so you yeah. all stayed together. And, and so what parts of it were loud? You remember? So like every couple seconds there would be a really loud bang. And once we got to like the middle of the haunt. Yeah. There's like one section where that bang was like really, really loud. I don't know if it was a scare actor banging, but yeah, it was really loud. So it was loud. And we didn't actually hear or see any actors in there. Yeah, in that one, but still had a good time. But that is a, certainly a little bit of a different experience where you're all holding onto a rope. So that one was pretty odd. Speaking of odd, next up came the weirdest haunt I'd say out of all the ones we did in all three parks. It was the chaos one, which was the alien theme one, which was by Fire. Hawk and Flight of Fear. Yeah. And it was weird. There, The guy who checks you in was like in a suit and I didn't hear of any what he was saying. But remember he had a full suit on so, and he was talking yeah, very... He was, a, he was like a lab scientist. Oh, okay. And it, he was good just watching him. Yeah, he was very theatrical. I didn't hear much of what he said. I think he was using a very deep, low oh, accent. Right, right, right. Then he almost was like a, a wrestling guy, like, oh! He had that kind of feel to him, so he was interesting. But what did you think of the haunt itself? It was okay. Like, it was so weird and random. Like, and it was so short. I think the premise was something like your astronauts and some kind of gas that leaked out. Yeah, and uh, like it's turning the astronauts into like weird aliens or something. And you see, yeah, like one actor who's kind of changing yeah. into one of these monsters. But and then there's one that's completely into a monster. And those costumes and the masks look really cool. Yeah, the lighting inside and the different machineries look really cool, but you're yeah. right, it was super short. And there are a couple cool props. Yeah, so I give them complete credit for doing something original and different. It looked beautiful. The storyline wasn't really fleshed out, but I thought it was interesting. I don't think it was scary at all. There was no part of it because it was all kind of very bright and I don't think there were any scares in there really, but I just thought it was different, so I'll give it credit there. Well, next step was going from a short one to a super long one, Field of Screams, and that was in the Dinosaur Alive area, right? Yeah. And that was really long, it right? It took so so long to get there. Like, actually, uh, almost 10 minutes to actually get to the line. That walk was forever. Yeah, yeah, you're going down that Dinosaurs Alive path. And the line itself wasn't even long once mm -hmm. we finally got there. But yeah, that was definitely a hike. And I'm trying to remember, like, some of the things you even walked through with that one. Oh, yeah. And I kept asking them if they liked corn, but they never answered They me. didn't answer you. Okay. Maybe they don't know English. Maybe. That one was kind of like a corn stalkers. Yeah, sort of. it was the same type of thing. No, I thought that one was okay. Next up, we did Kill Mart, which was right in the yeah, uh, that was Coney Island section there. Probably my third favorite out of all the ones that we did. Oh, okay. It was made to look like a Walmart, but in this way is Kill Mart. And at that point, the lines were getting pretty short as the park was only open for about a half hour more at that point. Yeah, I and think... That's the way we should do it in the future. Like, we should wait till the last hour or two and then start doing things because it's a lot quieter. That's our tip of the day. <laughs> well, tip of the day, yes, perfect. And in that way, there were still nine houses, though, so you can't get nine houses done in the last hour. But as we said with King's Dominion a couple years 
hours ago. That last hour is by far the best, and we got a lot in there at the end. And so, yeah, Kilmart I thought was really interesting. You start off by the cash registers, and you see the registers are all bloody. And there are a couple of other interesting surprises there. One that didn't make a lot of sense to us, but what was, was it? The that... car. Yeah, there was a car that I guess was supposed to crash through, like, one of the walls or something. And yeah. so that was kind of interesting. There were really effective places for people to... Oh, and didn't the person at the front of the line yell at me for something? Oh, probably. That why I you... forgot what it oh, was. Oh, well, and it probably was along with the messages, like, stay out, don't come in here. I remember it said that. It was painted on the front. And mm-hmm. a lot of cool places of merchandise for them to stand behind and jump out and scare you. I thought that one was very cool as well. Well, at that point in time, we had, like... Like 10 minutes left and we had one haunt still to do plus we wanted to get in what at the end which we had never done before a beast night ride this is where everyone else left for the night Jordan, Sarah and Steve and they were like oh that's pretty tough to do and so we headed over there and it was one of my favorite outdoor zones right by Backlot Sun Coaster. Do you remember what that area Pumpkin looked like? Eater? I love that. Is that what it was called? Pumpkin yeah. Eaters? So cool. That was beautiful. And I think Universal had something like that this year. But all the glowing pumpkins that were hung up and on the sides and even the scare actors for that scare area, I thought were amazing because they would really go after people. And so I thought that area looked beautiful. But that last time we went through, we were just sprinting. So we got to Slaughterhouse and and there was no line at all. And instantly we just went in and we were almost running through the house. We we're like, okay, yeah, that's scary. Okay, I see that. Yeah. Is this the one that was a lot of back and forth stuff? There's this one scene where it's just a bunch of crates and you go back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, it's through the crates, exactly. And you see through them and it's not that big of a deal. It was right at the end of the night, and it's at that point the last night of Haunt, and I think the actors were pretty happy to be done, so we didn't even see many. So after that, we just sprinted over to the Beast, and I think we got there with about two minutes left, and we got our night ride in on the Beast, our first one ever, as when we get to Kings Island, we're always either with Maddie, or we have to leave to get to another park, or leave to get home. So it was finally our first Beast night ride, and what did you think? I liked it. I mean, it's not as good as some people rave about it, but I like it a lot. Well, maybe it's because there's some people who rave about it. They've never done a better coaster at night. (laughs) Voyage. Right. For people who rave about their Beast Night Rides, Voyage or potentially a couple others as well, like Lightning Rod, maybe they've never done those. But still, it was great. We finally got to say we did it. And so I think that is a very cool night ride. And it was a great way to wrap up the night that we got everything in. For our ride of the day. Let's go with the monster rides, which are those ones that look like the octopus. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kings Island has one. Where else? Dorney. Yeah, exactly. What I like about those is that little kids, if they can walk and they're with an adult, they can ride them. Yeah. And that's a pretty intense ride for a little kid. What do you think of those? They're fun. I like the fact that when they're loading, you're stuck up in the air for like two or three minutes. And that's a great point because of the way that loads where you have some arms that are at the bottom and can can unload and the other arms have to, have to be at the top that you can be stuck there and on a really hot day in the sun that can be brutal so there's a good tip is to do those monsters in the spring or fall when it's cooler and it's a weird ride in that with the weight really affects things like i seem to spin a ton in those things i don't know if you and alex when you're together if you spin yeah like there would it, be like one random time where we start spinning really fast and yes. we'll won't spin for a while, then we'll just start spinning really fast. That's pretty cool. That's a really weird fact about that, that it's like it has different modes, and sometimes you're spinning gradually, and other times it's just crazy. And I don't think it has to do anything with weight, because, like, Alex and I, we only weigh, like, 90 pounds together. Or probably more than that, like 100 and something. Yeah, like like, 115, something like that. And, like, we would spin a lot at times and then not spin at all. And then we spin a lot, and yep. we, stick, we won't spin at all, so eh. it's just weird that way. I agree. And that way, I think they're very fun flat rides, even though they've been around a long time. Tip of the day, tip of the day, it's the tip of the day. Tip of the day, tip of the day, it's the tip of the day. Yeah! 
Our tip of the day. What do you want to do? I said try to do coasters until the last two or three hours because that's when the lines will die down and people will start leaving because the first few hours of hunt is when everybody will be at the lines and it'll be the most craziest. So try to do like the last two or three hours for your hunts because what happened to us, we only had 10 minute waits for the last couple of ones. And sometimes we had no wait at all. And then that idea that we stated before of haunt events I really don't think are for little kids. And it brings up another news story that I don't remember if I mentioned it to you about the lawsuit going on with Dorney that a woman and her teenage daughter went to a haunt two seasons ago and her daughter was very scared and it was in a haunt and a scare actor came behind her and whispered in her ear and she was so scared she fell forward and got hurt. And now they're suing Dorney for, for, for her being injured that she got so scared and the fact that they didn't know about the no boo necklaces what do you think about that lawsuit i think that's just dumb because the characters are getting paid to be scary and stuff it's dumb because it's not their fault that she fell they didn't know that she they didn't, didn't touch her be scared yeah. yeah exactly there are signs we see them all over the place on every single store about no yeah. boo necklaces like literally every single store there is and the other aspect of that is i think they also state that the no boo necklaces don't work Work in the mazes. You're going to a haunt with a girl that you know she's going to get scared. Yes, yep. And like there's all no boo necklaces everywhere and you can't pay like $5. I just think that whole thing is dumb. That being said, of course you don't like to hear about someone getting hurt, especially if it's hurt to a certain extent that it was badly hurt. But it's just not an event to go to if you're one who gets scared easily. So kind of a sad story there. And even if she doesn't win the lawsuit, and Cedar Fair is certainly I doubt a lot of money she in will. fees. Yeah, you, you wouldn't think so, but who knows? A good lawyer can do some interesting things with the law. Well, thanks so much for joining us again. Great to be back. We have added a second original video to our YouTube page, which you can find Theme Park Families on YouTube. Our first one was our Millennium Fork skit that we did for the Cedar Point contest. And our second one was another contest that we just did. What was that, bud? That was the Legoland Kid Reporter. So very exciting that our good friend EB over at Costa Radio sent us a little heads up about a contest that Legoland New York, which is opening up in 2020, is going to have for kid reporters who will report on the progress of the park and get to ride things early and test them out. And so we did a little video that we posted on my Facebook account and our Twitter page as well as now our YouTube page. So if you want to check that out, you can find that at Theme Park Families on YouTube. And I think you did a nice job on that. So it'll be fun to see towards the end of February if you get the gig. But even if not, it was a lot of fun to do. And Alex was able to help us out with that video. Yeah. So we've got a, a couple new episodes coming out here after this. We've got some interesting interviews that we'll be doing here for the rest of February and into March. So definitely look out for that. We are at Theme Park Fam at Twitter and at Theme Park Fam on on Facebook. Andrew can't wait for baseball season where you know he won't strike out. Well, only if I'm pitching. I bring the heat. Andrew out. Well, kiddies, wasn't that a bone-chilling deadcast? If you found this episode abusing and defrightful, make sure to leave a five-scar review on iTunes. So you better behave. You better not pout. It's time for me to scram so Crypt Keeper out! <laughs>